and looked around the higher education and the academic system, which in my mind has really not had any productivity improvements in well over 100 years, I, I was kind of shocked and, and, and disappointed. Um, I had the opportunity to become the Chief Information Officer of Ohio University and the Associate Provost. I also sit on a State of Ohio Commission that's called ETEC Ohio. It's made up of the Chancellor of the Board of Regents, the State Superintendent of Schools, the State CIO, and six of us as private citizens that are on there to advise uh, the state in terms of how to connect the citizens of Ohio to learning through technology. And uh, it's given me, one, a state level platform to look at things. Um, my role at Ohio University gave me also, a, and my previous time in Silicon Valley have given me connections with companies like Apple and others out there that many other people don't enjoy. So. That's kind of the, the background, and, and as I was looking at things in the early uh, part of this year, I realized in about March that there were tremendous changes taking places, truly uh, sea changes are happening. And that's what motivated me to put together EPIC 2020. Now it's, it's a, uh, based on a Creative Commons license, and it's really drawn off an earlier video that was called Epic 2014 that was done by four Notre Dame students back in 2004 and predicted the demise of the print news industry. And in 2004 and 5, that was a pretty radical idea. And at Ohio University, we have one of the top three journalism schools in the country, and the faculty there thought I was totally ridiculous with suggesting that by 2014 that most of the print news industry would be out of business. Well, <laughs> by 07 and 08, they weren't <laughs> so doubtful anymore. And as time has proven, uh, Newsweek uh, at the first of the year goes out of its print edition and will only be online. And it's not even 2014 yet. So uh, with that, in fact, the, the music that's in Epic 2020 was done by the same guy that did Epic 2014's music. Uh, but I used that model as kind of a futuristic, um, provocative conversation starter because I wanted to put something out that caused people to stop and question their educational paradigm perspective and to realize that there are changes coming and there are other ways to do things and that the way things have always been done is, is just not a satisfactory answer anymore. So um, I created Epic uh, 2020, put it out on the web in June. Uh, this week it's past 61,000 views of people checking it out from 125 com countries. And uh, I think I'm pleased that I think I've started the discussion that I hope to, to start. Now, the second tab after that, if you go on to the website, is 2012, The Tipping Point. And that's another 10-minute video that I did in front of about 100 angel investors in Columbus, Ohio, that talked about what's happening right now. So it's more a, a nice summary of what went on in the first six months and some uh, extrapolations of, of what uh, that might lead to. And so I'd encourage you to, to look at both of those videos. And I've tried to make the website a resource for people that are interested in transforming education. And it, it's, it's stuffed with a lot of uh, uh, national reports and uh, articles and things like that. So I'm trying to save people time and, and figuring out what's going on in that. However, in the last few months, the rate of articles and things has gone so high that I've almost quit trying to add them because I would be adding a, a dozen or so every day. And that's where I would suggest that if you're familiar with the Gardner hype cycle, that MOOCs are, are climbing what they refer to as the peak of inflated expectations. 
And so now there's more articles out there on how these things are going to change the world, and tomorrow it's going to be different, and tomorrow it's not going to be a lot different. But uh, And then after um, you have your inflated expectations, you fall into the trough of disillusionment. And I can see that happening early next year or by late next year. Uh, that will happen. And <clears throat> then you come out of that and you then really start seeing the transformational change. So I would say that, that the traditional universities right now, that the time is nearly run out for them to start responding to the coming changes, mainly because their reaction times are so extensive and the changes while they won't be this year or next, they will be starting to come in soon after that. And I know at Ohio University, it seems it's uh, three years to think about something and then five more years to try to even do something. So I hope it's better at, at Penn State. But anyway, um, let me just go over some of the, the main players right now. Uh, Coursera is one that you've probably heard about. They've got now started out with I think four universities and now are up to 30 courses with you know 100,000 people in it. Uh, they're growing very fast and I think they are going to be the first one to fall off into the trough of disillusionment because they are doing nothing in terms of quality control. They're allowing each university to kind of do things the way they do them. So there's no standardization and um, I think if anybody's going to hit the wall, they're going to hit a, a quality wall and a, a satisfaction wall uh, fairly soon. Now, the, the markets that they're going into is really an awful lot of people that just want to know something, that don't want a degree. And so this is where they'll go. And another part is people in the, the rest of the world. Over 60% of these courses are delivered outside of the United States. And so they're filling a need where nothing else exists. And that's if you study Clayton Christensen from Harvard uh, on disruptive innovation, that's where it always starts. It starts someplace where nobody else is serving a market and they serve it, learn how to serve it, and then they move up, up the food chain. Uh, edX, uh, which is the partnership of MIT and Harvard, is getting kind of a slow start, but I I think they're going to be a very sure start. And their um, basic revenue model is a low fee. In other words, you can take the course online, you can have your homework graded, you can do the exams, and after you demonstrate mastery, then you have the option to pay a, a very nominal fee, and this will be less than $100, and then they will send you a certificate. Now, the point I like to make is $100 isn't much until you put six zeros behind it. And if you're teaching over 100,000 people and they you know, come in, that, that turns into real money fairly fast. And the objective of edX is to um, educate 1 billion, 1 billion students. Now, let me put that in perspective back with Coursera. Coursera reached 1 million students within seven months. Facebook reached 1 million students in 10 months. So Coursera is growing at a faster rate than did Facebook. Facebook this year, five years later, has hit 1 billion users. Now, that makes edX's claim of going after 1 billion students not as ridiculous as it it may seem to uh, a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> but Udacity is the one that I think is, is the most impressive. And uh, we've invited Sebastian Theron, and it will be at our eTech Ohio conference in Columbus in February as one of our keynote speakers. Uh, and I think he is, is, is really doing it right. I had uh, the good fortune to take his initial course in uh, introduction to Artificial Intelligence back in October through December, and he was teaching 200 students on, on the Palo Alto campus, 
and was teaching online uh, 160,000 students and 23,000 of them passed all the exams and the uh, homework and out of those 253 had perfect scores. None of the 253 were on the Stanford campus. Of the 200 that were on the Stanford campus that took his course, by the last class there were only 41 attending class. The other 159 uh, had opted for the online version. He gave the toughest exam that he had ever given, and the passing rate of the on-campus group was one grade level higher. Now, he also, because they had taken it online rather than showing up for the class they were paying $4,000 for, um, he realized that of the 160,000 students he taught, those represented more students than all the rest of the computer science professors in the world taught that semester. The 23,000 that passed the course represented more students than most faculty will ever teach in their career. So now those are productivity kinds of things. And that's what then caused him to uh, resign his tenure from Stanford form um, Udacity, and uh, now they are building it very carefully, very logically, a uh, strong focus on quality, a strong focus on the student, and entirely different revenue models that don't require tuition. One is the employment agency model, and they have now got 300 companies signed up to uh, look at 3,000 resumes of their top students. Now, under an employment agency model in Silicon Valley, uh, a headhunter, which is what we used to call those folks, would get 20% of the new employee's first year salary. So if the company pays a new employee $100,000, then they will also pay the recruiter or the headhunter $20,000. And they're happy to do it because they need these people very badly. But at that kind of level, and they will be hiring at that kind of level of people of this quality, 50 people hired represents a million dollars. So they've already got 3,000 resumes out. Now, they've also got six top companies, uh, Google, Microsoft, um, NVIDIA, and several others, that are funding the development of specific courses for skill sets that these companies need. So these are corporate sponsorships on courses that will be developed and then once the course is developed, the delivery of it over the internet is, is virtually at zero variable cost. So it's really kind of a Cisco Academy expansion of, of training people. And I was involved with Cisco when they initially created the Cisco Academy, and when they uh, looked down the road, they realized they had a need over the next five years to have 500,000 people trained in how to use their equipment. And they thought, well, we really don't want to do that ourselves. And so they developed the Cisco Academy, put it out to community colleges and all sorts of people, and now they've engaged those people and training their future employees or the people that will work with their equipment. So it was a, a brilliant strategy uh, that is now, I think, going to be echoed by the likes of Google and, and, and Microsoft. And then once you do that, there's also the potential for advertising and a subscription service. If you think of, if you developed the World Standard Accounting 101 course, and put it out there. One, I can think of four big companies like Deloitte, Price, Waterhouse, and Coopers that would be very, very interested in both sponsoring the development of it and advertising on it. And the other feature that Udacity is doing is that I'm currently taking a statistics class from them. And once I sign up from that class, 
I am in it for the rest of my life. It never finishes. And so I can take it, learn what I need, I get emails, updates, of it, or I, I can take five years to finish the class. Or, and I will get emails, updates of what's going on. But now if you go back to the accounting example, and if you were still in all your accounting classes that you took 10 years ago and getting updates from it, you'd probably be willing to pay some subscription fees to do that. And accounting industry companies would be willing to pay advertising fees to connect to you. So here's a whole new way of connecting as well. And Udacity is also looking at the low fee model that edX is going to use as well. Now, another group that um, you need to be aware of, of course, is the Khan Academy. And here is another study in productivity. Uh, Sal Khan in 2009 started with a $10,000 personal investment in his bedroom closet that he set up as an office to develop course content. Before he had much of any other funding, he had developed and put online on YouTube over 2,000 courses. There are now over 3,000 courses online. He has gotten over $15 million in funding from Gates and Google and Kaufman and a whole bunch of other people. He now has a group of 20 of perhaps the best talent in the world that has come to work with him and taken huge salary cuts because they're on a mission to change the world, and they, they are doing that. The Khan Academy currently reaches 6 million people a month with a faculty of one, and that's productivity as well. Uh, besides the videos, though, if you have not, you need to look at their assessment system, and that what is there's a lot of experiments going on across the country right now, particularly in public schools, where teachers are no longer teaching content but are assigning the con videos. And the students can either do them at school or at home. And under the assessment system, which Khan has developed and is free, I mean, you, you could use it at Penn State, um, the teacher knows when those students come into the, the room the next day, down to the second, the time on task of each element of what they've looked at. They have to get 10 sequential right answers, demonstrating mastery, to move on to the next topic. And as they come into the class, the teacher has this wonderful dashboard, color-coded, and knows that typically out of a 30-student class, 25 to 26 will be getting it in, and the artificial intelligence in this program uh, has a, a very sophisticated way of, of understanding when a student's in trouble or if they're just kind of stuck on something or if they're doing okay. So the student or the teacher now can focus on the ones that are, are stuck or having trouble. And the ones that aren't can continue to go on at the rate that they're going on at. So this is an incredibly powerful system. And then last time I talked to the folks there, um, they're working now on a new platform that will probably be out in another four or five months. And it will automatically do translations into eight different languages of all the Khan Academy materials. Now, this is materials in math from 1 plus 1 through calculus, trigonometry, linear algebra, statistics, all those kinds of things, and, and many other courses. Um, so there's a whole new approach that uh, right now people are looking to supplement the traditional system with it. But in many of their prototype experiments, uh, they are actually replacing much of the traditional system. And, and the teachers are excited because they are no longer regurgitating content for a bulimic testing exercise. They are actually able to work with the students that have the problem. And this is a much more satisfying role for most teachers. Uh, so it, it, it's not viewed as a negative at all. Khan Academy may also buy a school out in Palo Alto where they will actually create a research center where they can immediately implement new concepts, test them out, and, and see what the results are. And, 
And that's another power of the system. When you're dealing with more than 100,000 and starting up into the millions, you now have information on how long does it take somebody to understand what you're trying to get across. And you can then start asking yourself, okay, video six needs improved because people are spending way too long trying to figure that out. We must not be communicating well on that and, and things like that. So um, that's where I, I, that's kind of the, the background of where the industry and things are right now. And maybe this would be a, a good time, Kyle, to just stop and see if there, we got some questions because then I've got some suggestions for uh, how Penn State might think about these things. Great, Bill. Thanks for that introduction. If anyone has questions, please type them into the chat box. Larry has one. He doesn't need to type because he's in the room with the microphone. Go ahead, Larry. So I'm wondering, Bill, as you look at these um, three or four different models that are emerging, what, what are the key differences between these systems that um, that distinguish one one from the other. Uh, for example, I suspect you're going to say the word quality. Uh, you, you mentioned um, both the Khan Academy and Udacity model having a higher quality. Are there other variables that you would point to or see as unique differences between these different uh, methods? Um, I think those are the two, but there are others that are coming. I mean, these guys are just beginning to scratch the surface. I, they really have not included uh, engagement concepts from the computer gaming industry at all. And, and once they start bringing those in, I, you have to appreciate that when you're talking in the public school system, students sit in class for, what, a little over around six hours a day. They spend that much time with Sony and Nintendo as well. So these folks have already learned out how to capture them for equal amounts of time. Now, if you put some productive education into it, it, it gets even better. But I, I think right now we're in the birth of a new situation. There's going to be a lot of new things tried. Some will work, some won't. But Every failure will be a, a step forward in, in improving what gets done. And, and that's the key that I see in these. It's you got to be doing things, and it's just as valuable to fail as it is to succeed because, you know, you, those failures are things that you can set aside and, and profit from and, and move on from there. Thank you, Bill. So we've got a question in the chat box from Jack Matson, who asks, what about the Udemy business model of charging tuition directly? Um, yeah, and U Udemy um, versus Udacity, I've hardly even kept track of them because they're, they're probably, to me, they're just another low-cost online kind of course. I mean, if you go on to iTunes University, there are uh, 800 schools that have stuff up there. Some of it is, is quite good. There's some stuff from Harvard that is outstanding. Um, but others, it's the Sage on the Stage video. And that just doesn't do it. I mean, if, if you compare that to the movie industry, I mean, when motion pictures were invented, the early movies was a fixed camera taking a picture of something happening on a stage. I mean, it was the paradigm of you're sitting in a seat and you're watching a stage performance. Well, pretty soon they figured out they could move the camera, then they added audio, and then they added color, and now they've added animation, and, and telling something physical from digital now is, is almost impossible. So we're back at the fixed camera taking a picture of the stage, as far as I'm concerned, that's wide open for innovation. Thanks, Bill. Now, the, uh, the next two questions really come down to K-12. 
So Jason asked, uh, most of you have been talking about what will happen in higher education and outside the K-12 domains. How will these changes affect how K-12 will be taught? And then right below him, Larry asked the, pretty much the same thing. How do you see this extending to K-12 and university acceptance of these models being used at that level? In other words, uh, you know, from people from two different countries are wondering, okay, so we've been thinking a little about, about, about higher ed. Talk to us about K-12 for a moment if you can. Yeah, and I'd like to talk more in terms of um, K to gray. And we talk about lifelong learning, but we have very few structures set up for lifelong learning and non-traditional people. I, I see an education system that starts at about three and ends when they close the lid on you. Um, and uh, you know, we all kind of philosophically talk about it, but yet we divide it up into these crazy sections that are really based on the Carnegie uh, industrial model. I mean, seat time is still the main measurement, which is absolutely nuts. I'd challenge anybody to show me a study that seat time correlates in any way to knowledge. And yet, You've got, you know, three-hour courses and four-hour courses, five-hour courses. You're still measuring seat time rather than learning. So in my view, education has served us well up until this point. But now with the technologies that we've got, we can, we can go an order of magnitude above what we're doing now. And I would suggest that the kids that are coming up that are, are – starting the Khan Academy in first grade, are doing the videos that uh, we've got schools in Ohio that in first and second grade, they're doing PowerPoint presentations. They know how to do animations and videos. I, these are, this is a new world <laughs> of young people coming up. Now, unfortunately, there are just a few of those. And then we've got places like where I live in Appalachian, Ohio, that are are a decade behind. So uh, the disparity is the biggest problem. Bill, Chris asked uh, about how the models are supporting meaningful interaction between learners, uh, like you might have in face-to-face -face school. And I know I've heard a little bit about all different kinds of student support groups that form around MOOCs. And some, of, some are intentional and built in by the MOOC providers. But there are a lot of other informal things happening in terms of student interaction. What can you tell us about that? They are. And, and in that AI course that I took, uh, they had set up a, a class blog where anybody could send in a question. But then they used a very clever Facebook system that students would rate the questions as likes. So the questions with the most likes rose to the top, and they were really a great screening way to uh, bring up the best questions. Then other students would start to answer them. And again, there were 253 students with perfect scores. So these, this was a smart cohort of spread around the world. Um, and they used an Amazon system of five stars of how helpful was this answer. So the students were then, in an essence, teaching one another through this system. But in addition to that, there were all sorts of uh, social network groups that sat up, set up, that became established, that helped one another. There's a, a classic story of uh, a 12-year-old in Pakistan that was taking one of the physics classes that uh, when the uh, video came up about um, that uh, upset all the Muslims, uh, of um, a problem with that YouTube video and Pakistan cut off YouTube literally in the middle of her final exam. And she tweeted that she was having a problem and people from Finland and other places got together and provided her the information she needed to finish her, her um, exam. So these are using the social network. Now, yeah, it doesn't have the face-to-face -face kind of thing. It, and that is one of the things that, you know, uh, the traditional area can, can really look at. But having um, gotten three degrees myself, I think 
the face-to-face -face time I had and spent in many classes is significantly overrated. And particularly in introductory classes, when you've got two or 300 people, I think anybody that makes a case for there's great face-to-face -face time is uh, kidding themselves. Thank you. Uh, John Shank asks, are you aware of any innovative approaches to hybrid slash blended learning? Uh, I suppose Khan Academy could be one depending on how it's used by instructors. Do you see anything, uh, any innovative uses of hybrid and blended learning that we should uh, bring up in this context? Well, I was fortunate to have an involvement about 10 years ago at Ohio University with their um, MBA program Without Boundaries, which is was one of the very early blended learning programs and um, was highly successful. I, I think um, this, to me, is probably a more optimum kind of approach um, in that having um, what we're really trying to do is teach people how to learn. And as you do that, then there's a tremendous amount of content that does not have to be provided in, in a classroom situation. However, the classroom situation does offer the human interactivity that is very hard to get in many other ways. And so that's where I think the focus should be changing of to how do you use all these moments that a person is going to invest in learning this specific specific subject and make them as effective and efficient as possible. If they can get the majority of the content online, but then have meaningful and deeper discussions when they come together physically, to me, that's, that's the best of everything. Now, the next couple of questions, uh, I have one that came to me on a slip of paper uh, from a participant in the room. It's kind of like the first part of Jason's question in the chat. You know, what will universities be able to do to survive? In other words, what, what's your recommendation for universities? The one that came to me uh, by hand is said he's interested in hearing Bill's views on how this applies to Penn State. You know, you said you have a few ideas. So if you were, to, if you were in charge of a major institution right now, and I know you did your time, and you're 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 off uh, uh, recovering from having led a major institution. Uh, but what what would your advice be to the leaders of major institutions, and to those of us who may not be in the lead, but maybe uh, care very deeply about uh, what it is our institutions can accomplish and what we need to do? Well, that that segues into my next uh, series of comments very well. So thank you for that that lead in. And uh, I would suggest that folks in your position really are the change agents. Um, I, right now, the top level leadership, um, I am hard pressed to find some good examples of right now of, of who's really out in front on this. Uh, and let me back up a little bit as far as uh, some of my views. Again, I spent my life in industry, and I spent my life in an industry that was revolutionizing things. I saw the demise of the mechanical calculator market in a six month period of time when TI came out with the first electronic calculator. I saw the creation of uh, digital watches and the advent of the initial microprocessors. And now with iPhones doing more than uh, some of the largest um, advanced computers of 20 years ago. <clears throat> I have seen all these changes, and I see the same stage set now for change in education, in that universities can really be viewed as a mature industry, even though I know they don't like to be thought of as an industry, and everybody says, Bill, you know, you know, we're not, we're not like industry, and that used to be a point of pride, and now I'm beginning to think that's the definition of the problem, and that industry does improve productivity. Um, but as a mature industry, the classic definition of a mature industry is they are risk adverse, they are self-satisfied, and often too expensive. And uh, that can 
kind of describe an awful lot of what I've seen anyway in, in traditional universities. Uh, the biggest thing that I think w is a need to shift from being organization-centric to student-centric, and ideally I would say customer-centric, in that I define students as people that you do something to and customers as people you do something for. And when you change that mindset, then you look at how you do things in an entirely different way. And that's exactly what Udacity and the Khan Academy have done, is that they are looking of how do we help somebody learn things faster and easier and cheaper. And when you, do, when you start asking those kind of questions, you invent an awful lot of really good solutions. Now, if instead you're asking the question of how do we save the organization, then I think you're on a uh, very dangerous course. Uh, because in my view of the world, no organization has an innate right to exist. An organization exists because they create value. And when you lose sight of that, and whether it's a government, a religion, a university, or a company, they, there is no innate right to exist. So once you get past that, then you start moving toward the customer-centric of how can we create value and how can we do it better, faster, cheaper. Now, uh, what I would like to suggest, and in your case and others like you, uh, one, you're in a terrifically good position because uh, you're a flagship university. And I think if you have the highest probability of survival of most of the schools in the state, I think the mid-level schools are, are going to be very hard-pressed to survive. I somewhat tongue-in-cheek uh, refer to them as in 2020, the uh, movie, as becoming maturational holding grounds. It's where you park your kids for about four years so they're safe, uh, they have a good time, they meet their uh, spouse, uh, they attend sports and cultural events, and perhaps they learn something along the way as well. And uh, I, I, I see this as a definite trend. But anyway, what I, as a more productive kind of thing, I have what I call the judo theory of management. And that is to essentially use your competitor's strengths to defeat them by subtly changing their direction of force. And under a judo theory of management, I would suggest embracing the new offerings that are coming out and looking at how they can be integrated into your system. Especially, I know at Ohio University, we have 35% of our incoming freshmen take remedial English and math. Now, they come out of a high school where they get it for free, and now they're paying full loaded university costs to get something they should have gotten back in high school but didn't. And everybody points the fingers at one another. Well, there's a place, the Khan Academy, could be the perfect remediation tool that you have to pass the assessment system that's online and for free uh, that is in the Khan Academy before you can take the other courses. And it's free. So you're not paying the college tuition to gain the knowledge that you should have had. So it, it's... Can we take things like that and put it into our system, make it better for the students and cheaper, and not have to use our resources to, to do, I mean, teaching remedial math and English has got, <laughs> is not the highest goal in life of most of the faculty. So uh, it's how do you use what's out there in these free courses? Uh, and as I said, if you can cut the students' cost by you know, they prove that they've done something in the Khan Academy, then great. Uh, the Colorado State has got an assessment system now with uh, Udacity, that if you can take the Udacity course 
Uh, you take their final exam and you get credit for introduction to artificial intelligence for just the cost of the assessment. And I think particularly flagship schools like um, Penn State, if you were willing to do that and, and find, you know, I mean, you have to be convinced that if the people take these courses and can pass the same exam that they do uh, sitting in the course, why should they pay for sitting in the course? Now, again, putting on the customer-centric hat, that allows people to dramatically reduce their tuition costs, take more courses, accelerate their time to the degree, all of which should be good things. And I would suggest that the increase that you would see in people wanting to come to your institution far outweighs anything that you're going to lose in terms of the revenues and, and other, other things like that. You got some big smiles from uh, Pat Shope. She's our prior learning assessment person. And we have a question from Stephanie in the room. Do you want to take a question now, or do you want to keep going for a moment? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Stephanie. All right, my question is about using um, Khan as a resource for remedial English, let's say, because there are what seems to be no good machine grading techniques for liberal arts courses or things like English. So what kind of paradigm shift do you see needing to happen before we can actually use it for things like teaching remedial liberal arts courses? Well, certainly, well, you, certainly you, you pick the, uh, the most difficult one. It, it's certainly easy for math uh, and the sciences and stuff like that. But in English and where you have more subjective kinds of things, uh, I think people are still struggling with how to do that. There are, of course, some things of peer grading and, and stuff like that, um, which if, if you really think about the course in, in different ways, um, that, in fact, that was one of the things that Sebastian Thurn got through in his first class. He was only allowing the students one try to get the correct answer on the, the little test vignettes that are done throughout any given presentation. And he realized that he was hung up on grading rather than causing learning. And once he got past that and said, I really want to cause learning, and the grading comes later. And so then he allowed students to try the answers until they got it right, and then he added videos of for if you got it wrong, here's how to think about it, and, and stuff like that. So <clears throat> English, and, and particularly writing, are things that um, just need to be done. And then ways need to be found. And, and I would guess that in the next couple of years, artificial intelligence is going to get pretty good at uh, looking at the you know, sentence structure and the grammar already. Grammar and punctuation uh, things are there. But um, I, I, don't, I don't have any silver bullet for you on that one. It's, it's still a, a developing area. A question here from Margaret. It says, how close are we to a major tipping point when a large corporation stops requiring an undergraduate degree and turns to competency-based education or digital badges? Uh, well, I would suggest the fact that Google and Microsoft and Envision, NVIDIA rather, um, are funding courses at um, um, Udacity that we're getting very close. You, you have to appreciate the badges concept by Mozilla, the open source badges project. It was only launched, I think, in October of 2011. It's barely a year old. Um, I'm working with a company right now in uh, Columbus that's in high technology, uh, particular software development. And we've got massive discussions going on of how can we um, develop this badges concept. Now, uh, on, on that area, unfortunately, Mozilla called it badges, which I think they've got a wonderful concept and a terrible terminology, because the, the terminology really causes you to think of Boy Scout and Girl Scout badges and 
and things like that. And I think that's not the right way to think about them. In fact, the discussions I'm having with this company is that they should think of them like bubbles. And that bubbles can expand, that can represent increasing information. They can have a lot of other bubbles connected to them on the side. There may be even bubbles inside of bubbles. And it gives you a physical visualization that I think allows you to think about it a lot better than just badges. But bubbles have the same problem with terminology that badges have. So I've suggested that they really look at um, the assessment and ranking system that you find in World of Warcraft. And here is a, is a computer game that's been around for close to a decade, has nearly a, a million people at any given time on it. They're going out on quests in groups of 40 to 100, or 10 to 100, mainly about average, about 40 to 50. Uh, all kinds of skill levels. If you tell somebody you're a necromancer 57, they generally know exactly what you can do and how you fit into an organization. And I think, particularly in the world of computer games, that is a resource to be studied. These people have figured out an awful lot of things. They have project management systems that are an order of magnitude beyond what exists in the typical corporation. Because you're not only managing a sequence of events, you're managing art, you're managing uh, what's the engagement of the person that's doing this, all sorts of different things that the computer gaming people have figured out. Now, if we can figure out how to take what they know and how they do it and apply it to education, you've got then, to me, the, the, uh, the ideal. Thank you. I got, I got so caught up in what you were saying that I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, look at the, I wasn't watching the questions. <laughs> so I, uh, anybody have a question in the room that they haven't been saying? Stephanie? Yeah, Bail me out here. A comment uh, back to K-12 and remediation. There's uh, some thought out there that with the move to Common Core standards, companies will start producing resources that can be purchased and used at home for remediation and um, practice testing in order to be certain that students um, who have an interest can really do that from home. Um, yeah, well, certainly uh, companies like Pearson has finally um, woke up to the fact that they'd better start changing and get on the, the technology bandwagon or, or they're going to look more like uh, Borders than uh, Barnes and & Noble. And um, so, yeah, and I, I keep wondering, and that's why I use the examples of uh, Google and Amazon and Apple. I mean, higher education is an $800 billion market in the United States. Public education is an $800 billion market in the United States. So that's $1.6 trillion that at some point I've got to believe that companies are going to figure out, we can do this, and we can do it pretty well. And um, I don't know when that's going to come. I, I think... Some other things that are going to happen, uh, like I put in EPIC 2020, is that as these free online courses come from MIT and Harvard and, and Stanford, and legislators look at, wow, the student debt is going off the charts. Uh, now there are articles coming out on the impact on parents and grandparents who have co-signed for student loans that have gone into default and are losing their retirement kinds of things. I mean, these are horror stories that are only going to get worse. And I, uh, and my call to action in EPIC 2020 is that parents should not try to convince the universities to change or the public schools, but the legislators, because there you only have a couple of dozen people that sit on the finance committees who really want what's good for their citizens. So they don't have the vested interests that the, that the 
education group has in their own survival. And if they start requiring that um, students can test out, uh, start requiring that they can't move forward until they reach a certain demonstrated level of capability, the Khan Academy does an excellent job on that. So uh, the dots are going to get connected over the next several years. Thanks, Bill. Larry asks, are there any examples of higher ed uh, institutions that seem to be getting it, that are actually incorporating MOOCs and, and other uh, innovations into their programs? You see some that are out ahead of others? Well, I think MOOCs are, are so new that that group hasn't happened yet. So I think, you know, you guys have got the chance to be in that group as well as anybody. I'd say the one higher education group that I've been the most impressed with for the longest <clears throat> period of time is the Western Governors University, and that they are truly customer-centric, and that when you talk to them, it's how can we make the experience better for the student? How can we retain more of the students? Why are we losing them? How can we, you know, offer them other choices? Um, as opposed to the rigidity that I see in, in most of the other approaches. So that would be where I'd look. Okay, other questions coming through here? I wonder if Bill has any questions for us. Okay, Larry wants to know if you have any questions for us, Bill. Oh, you, oh, guys you guys are, are good. good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we got like 35 people counting this room and the others, so we can probably talk to you about most things. Uh, uh, actually, actually, not really. Not really. Um, uh, if you could turn off the, yeah, thanks. Um, but what I would like is to uh, have you give some thought about an ongoing discussion, particularly with the things I'm doing with uh, the corporate clients that I'm starting to work with. Because I think that's the other big thing that's missing in higher education is that there's too much insulation from the, the corporate world. And that what I'm seeing in this one particular technology company that I'm working with is a question of not just how do we develop the skill competency. I mean, the, the people they hire, computer science backgrounds, they're good programmers. And when they want to get promoted, they don't. And the answer that the company's been giving them is, well, there's a lot of other stuff that you don't have. And of course, the people ask, well, what's the other stuff? And they're really struggling right now to come up with an answer. But a lot of it's the ability to work on a team. It's the emotional intelligence level. It's the ability to communicate. It's the ability to listen, critical thinking. All of those kind of things come into it. And so I, I see this as the opening of a wonderful potential for discussion and dialogue with the academic world of, you know, how do we truly make a well-rounded person? I, my fundamental baseline philosophy is that the, the objective of any organization whether it's making a product, whether it's a city government, whether it's a religion or whatever, should be the optimization of the potential of every person in that group. And if you set that as your foundation, then you'll make a lot of good decisions if you use that as the test point. And that's what they're trying to do. How can we optimize the potential of all of our employees and, and they're talking in much broader terms than just getting a job done, but of having personal satisfaction, of having a quality family life, of having a quality life experience kind of thing. And um, so I'm seeing corporations deal with this because the knowledge worker of the 21st century is not the factory worker that uh, existed um, in the in the twentieth century. So um, anyway, I don't know if that helps or not. Yes, 
That was helpful. I, I, I see we're uh, running up against our time frame, but if there are a couple of other quick questions, please feel uh, free to blast one into the chat box. By the way, I, uh, while you're coming up with other questions, I'd just like to say that we'd love to have Bill come visit us. He's currently on the West Coast, and he's rambling, and uh, uh, one of my goals is at some point in the next year to, to get him out here for a face-to-face -face day and a half or two days or whatever we can get. So keep that in mind. Keep us in mind, Bill. Uh, when, when your schedule looks good, know that we want you to, to come visit face-to-face -face as well. Okay, a question okay, about well, what... Go ahead. I'll be back in Ohio in uh, March. Uh, we just don't do winters there anymore. We'll be heading off to Mexico for a couple months here pretty soon. It's 45 degrees here today, Bill. And rainy and gray. <laughs> oh, you got more than 45? Oh, never mind. Okay, uh, so Stephanie's wondering if you can tell us more about the Ohio conference. Is there a conference oh, you oh, yeah. 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 If you go, if you go online, online to eTech Ohio, um, I think it's .gov, but just Google eTech Ohio, and the conference will come up, and in, it's in February. And um, Sebastian Thurn will be the keynoter on Wednesday. It's, it's a three-day conference, Monday through Wednesday. We usually have about 6,000 people attend. Uh, there'll probably be 2,000 people attending his keynote speech. We have uh, 300 breakout sessions over that period of time and 200 exhibitors. And it's probably one of the top three academic technology conferences in the United States. So it, if you can make it down to Columbus or over to Columbus, uh, it, it's well worth it. Great. We can probably even work out a bus or something. Columbus is uh, not Here that far come, away, yeah. as you know. So, well, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I hate to cut this off, but I, I uh, asked you for an hour, and you were gracious enough to give us an hour. I know people have carpools, probably need to jump in. But I want to uh, end by just thanking you uh, sincerely for spending time with us and sending the wake-up call and uh, for perhaps coaching us uh, through the next uh, few months and years as we uh, try to make sense of this. Uh, the big takeaway for me was, were your, was your uh, urging us to, you know, think about the customer and not think about how to save the institution, but how to serve the, serving the uh, learner and how to incorporate uh, that into our philosophy. And that will, uh, doing that is what will preserve the institution. So, uh, uh, we don't have a right to survive. I heard you say that, and I understand that, and I agree. And I think we all need to uh, figure out how to reinvent uh, ourselves given these tools and uh, to rethink the services we can provide. So, Bill, uh, thank you very much on behalf of the 35, 40 people that saw you now. We did record the session. I was, always, as always, a couple minutes late getting it started, or a minute and a half or so. I just missed a few, <laughs> few pieces. But uh, it will be posted so that people who, can, who weren't here uh, can see it. So if all of you will, uh, uh, who saw it would just tell people that we are going to post it and we'll, uh, we'll post a recording. And thanks again, Bill. Really appreciate your Thank work. You, Bill. <laughs> and my goal in life is to help people like you be successful. So anything that I can do, I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. And, if you'd be sure to send me a link to that, uh, I will uh, redirect other people to the, your site as well. I will, Bill. Thank you very much. Bye, all. Thank you all. It's a great turnout. We uh, hope to see you in other uh, sessions we run. Thanks a lot. Thanks, folks.